Chapter 5. The Box In the one photograph of him mum had, taken at their wedding, Dad was handsome. Not much taller than me, but three times as burly, with thick, straight, strong eyebrows and gentle eyes. There was a sadness to him, like a frightened dog trying to hide his weakness. His mouth was firmly closed and he didn't seem like he was particularly talkative. His hair seemed soft and floppy and tumbled over his ears and down his neck. Mum was standing close to him, as if she could not lot it love him more, and as if she was prepared to protect this fragile giant from anything that came his way. When Mum led us into a basement room I had no idea even existed, and showed us Jonathan Joestar's head, he looked exactly like the picture, except his eyes were closed, and there was nothing below the neck. When she told us she kept the severed head of my father for fifteen years since his death, I'd imagined a skull, with no flesh intact, but this head looked like he'd been killed mere moments ago. No, like he was still alive. The colour of his skin was normal, with a healthy glow. His hair and eyebrows and eyelashes were black, like they were wet. His lips were pursed. This was an oddly attractive severed head. Mum kept it in a beautiful glass case that she clearly cleaned often. George, this is your father, Mum said, but he seemed so alive I was afraid to say hello in case he opened his eyes and answered. It... It is dead, right? I asked. Don't call him it! Mum snapped, the whip crack in her voice at least twice as strong as I'd ever heard it. She wasn't my mum here. She was this head's wife. Sorry, but he really looks like he's still alive, I said. Mum didn't answer. He was dead, right? Gracious, Lisa Lisa said, her hands in her mouth. This all came as a shock to her, too. Then the rest of him... That horrible man who was in the box with us. He really... You remember, Lisa Lisa? Yes, I thought it was a dream. That man was so scary, and you were so scared that I... I didn't really understand. But it seemed like you loved each other, and he seemed like George's father. But George's father was never so fearsome he made the very air around him quiver. Like she loved him. What did that mean? Confused I looked at Mum, and she looked guilty. This confused me more. What did it mean? In that box or coffin, while I was still inside her? What happened? Mum sighed. If you saw all that, of course you saw it. The box was so very small. But to actually remember it? You really are extraordinary, Lisa Lisa. Sorry. You did nothing wrong. <laughs> I suppose you did remember Jonathan's final breath after all. I was scared, I think. Desperate. Yes, and that fear didn't end when we escaped the ship. Let me start at the beginning, Mum said. She had Straits and Penelope go upstairs, leaving only Lisa Lisa and myself. There was a couch, an easy chair, and a table placed opposite the glass cabinet. It was clear Mum came down here sometimes and spent time with him. Mum sat on the easy chair, and Lisa Lisa and I sat next to each other on the couch. This didn't leave us facing her. The couches were arranged diagonally, like the letter V, so that she could gaze upon my father's head no matter which you were sitting on. It was clear Mum would sometimes lie down on this couch, gazing at father. Just the two of them. Even now, her eyes weren't looking at us, but at him. We sat there a while, but Mum didn't say anything, so I tried to process the terrifying story that I'd just heard. The horrible fate of Jonathan Joestar and Dio Brando. My uncle had become a vampire. I had been a naive fool. The story of my parents and the mystery of my birth was something I should have thought about, doubted, asked about. But I'd been too busy wallowing in self-pity to do that. Thinking about it now, I should have at least how only Mum managed to survive the sinking of a ship with so many passengers, especially when my father, for all his muscles, didn't. Passenger ships were equipped with a large number of lifeboats in case an accident happened. But if the explosion had been so sudden nobody else survived, then Mum must have known about the explosion at least a few minutes before it happened. If she'd known, Dad would have. If Dad hadn't survived with her, then he must have died before the explosion or been close to death. She must have hidden in the box just before the explosion, with no time to save anyone else. Otherwise Mum would almost certainly have bought his body with her. Mum would never leave Dad behind, even if he was dead. Lisa Lisa understood that as well which was why she'd levelled these accusations. And this special box. Why was such a thing conveniently by Mum's side in a situation so dire only she and Lisa Lisa could escape? Why was it so strong it could survive a ship exploding? 
because someone had needed that box, and Mum was with that someone, that someone being the vampire, Dio. Mum had witnessed him killing Dad. Only his head remained, even though it was Dio who'd only been a head right before the ship exploded. What happened to my father's body? There was an obvious answer, but I was afraid to think it. The terrifying man in Lisa Lisa's memories explained it, but Lisa Lisa had said Mum and that man seemed like they loved each other. I had no idea what that meant. I didn't want to know, but I couldn't stand up and run upstairs. Straits and everyone were waiting up there, and they'd laugh if I ran. I'd already shown Straits how pathetic I was five years ago. I'd refused to face this kind of stuff back then, but if I ran from their school and went outside, even more terrifying things awaited me. The very things I'd incurred shame to avoid might get me. There was nowhere on the island for me to hide. Lisa Lisa grew impatient and started asking questions about the very things I didn't want to hear. Mum Erina, did you save Dio from that explosion? Don't think I'm being unsympathetic. Just, if only George's father's head is here, then that must be because Dio stole his body, right? I can see why you'd want to protect your husband's body. You could never have known just how terrifying Dio Brando really was. You would have wanted Jonathan Joestar's flesh to survive, even if that meant it was Dio Brando's body. Nobody's blaming you for that. But what bothers me is the intimacy between you, so strong I sensed it even as a baby. You and Jonathan were friends as children, right? Which means Dio was too. I went to England, researching Dio Brando's life. I went to the remains of the Joestar Manor. I talked to people in town. They told me you and George's father first became a couple where you were 15, but that Dio Brando forced you to split up. Some people even said you cheated on Jonathan. I didn't believe them, but Dio Brando clearly did something that made it so the two of you couldn't look at each other. I'd always assumed the man who murdered George's grandfather and became a vampire was a violent evil man, but to my surprise he was very popular with people around the Joestar Manor, more popular than Jonathan. He was smart, a gentleman, had many friends, both men and women. He was a rugby star, but never lauded it over anyone. His teammates trusted him completely, and he always had time for his fans. He was the most popular person in town. Half of them still believe he was innocent. He was quite popular with the ladies, but seemingly never had a girlfriend. Many people seem to think that's because he loved you, Mum Mariner. Whatever happened when you were 13 has become quite the romantic legend. I guess my point is... If George's father didn't tell you anything about Dio Brando, and the vampire's public image was of a splendid gentleman, that I can understand you being confused on the raft. Hm? What was Lisa Lisa implying? The mood was too tense for me to dare ask. Elizabeth? Mum said, catching her eye. It was so rare for her to address Lisa Lisa by her real name we both gasped. Yes? Lisa Lisa squeaked. You're only sixteen, Mum said. A little girl like you should never attempt to speak of manners of the heart as if she could possibly understand. You know nothing yet. At the least, you have no idea what there was between myself and Jonathan, and what remains between us today. Woof, I'd seen her scold Lisa Lisa before, but she never got this emotional. I knew this wasn't because Lisa Lisa had hit the nail on the head, or because her pride had been wounded, or anything petty like that. Lisa Lisa knew that too. Mum avoided letting bitterness or anger or other negative emotions show. The angrier she got, the calmer she was, the more chilly her behaviour. She never smiled more than when she was faced with unpleasantness or misfortune. But now, her anger made her act angry, and this was clearly because it involved my father. But I suppose there are many things you couldn't help to understand, because I haven't told you anything, she said, her tone gentle again. I was relieved. Lisa Lisa must be as well. Except Mum had one more snap of the whip inside her. But there's no excuse for speculating on puerile rumours. Then Mum began her story. Dio Brando was evil from the day I met him. Sly, cruel and manipulative. He made no attempt to hide his lust for control. But he was so charismatic, many people unreservedly admired his behaviour. The only people not blinded to his true nature were those who didn't want his favour and there weren't many of them. The vast majority approved of his brash cunning, and realised instinctively if they ever crossed him, he would destroy them. They may not have been conscious of it, but they were desperate to stay on his good side. Anyone who enraged him would be cast out, tormented by his lackeys. People saw this and were afraid to get involved, 
they averted their eyes, and they refused to even talk about him. So the only ones who knew his true evil, who were forced to see the blackness of his soul, were those not allowed to curry favour, not allowed to avert their eyes, those he directly and methodically went after. This was primarily Jonathan Joestar, but only for a short period after Dio joined the Joestar family. Once he forced me and Jonathan apart, he ceased attacking Jonathan directly and turned his focus towards me. Not that he ever did anything. He simply watched me closely, making sure I never came near Jonathan. At first he was, I thought he was trying to force Jonathan into suicide. After all, when Jonathan and I first drew close, Dio had stolen every friend Jonathan had except his pet dog. Shortly after, I heard that dog Danny had died in a horrible, mysterious accident. Jonathan was completely alone now, I thought. But Dio completely changed the way he treated Jonathan, like he was a different person entirely. All Jonathan's old friends returned, and he began throwing his arm over Jonathan's shoulders with a friendly smile, as if there'd never been a conflict between them. From a distance, I could tell Jonathan found this disconcerting. While having his friends back was a relief, he never was quite able to shake the suspicion Dio's face engendered. In other words, Dio had left him dangling on the cliffs of solitude. Being surrounded by pretend friends he could never really trust preserved his isolation permanently. If he'd been left alone, he may well have found a real friend somewhere else. Dio had saved himself the effort of crushing each new friend individually. But while the other boys were allowed in Jonathan's company, he kept a close watch on me, keeping me from getting close. More than anything, this convinced me of the truth, that no matter how much Dio tried to prevent it, I alone, if we so much as saw each other, if we so much as exchanged a glance, I could reach Jonathan's heart. That's why he worked so hard to keep that from happening. Knowing how awful it must be for Jonathan, unable to trust anyone around him, I wondered for a long time if I should do something. In the end, I gave up. After all, Jonathan Cthulhu could fight for me, but he could not protect me. I was shocked to hear Mum say this. I mean, Dad was right over there. He may be just ahead, but he seems so alive. Mum saw the look on my face and laughed. Don't worry, George. I said as much many a time while speaking with your father down here. What about speaking ill of the dead? (laughs) You see, there was something else I knew. I knew Jonathan would never let Dio destroy his life. I knew fate would bring us together again one day. But what brought that about was much worse than I could ever have imagined. I became a nurse, and Jonathan was brought to my care from the fire at the Joestar Mansion, badly injured, barely alive. A short time later, Jonathan left me again, without a word, to continue his fight. I didn't mind. I kept the faith and he came back to me, once again badly hurt. He'd settled matters with Dio Brando at last, and we were married, or so I believed. Dio had survived, or at least his head. Once again he tried to pry me from Jonathan. (laughs) My husband was a bit of a fool, you see. What kind of idiot doesn't bother looking for the body of an immortal vampire? Mum looked over at Dad's head and smiled, not a trace of sadness or regret just tenderness and love. She was an amazing woman, I thought. I heard Lisa Lisa gulp. Now we're getting to the heart of the matter, Mum said. Lisa Lisa and I exchanged glances. What happened when Jonathan and Dio Brando fought for a third time? And what happened to me, Lisa Lisa and George inside me while we were adrift on that box? She closed her eyes for a minute, then opened them and began. The scene on the ship was like something from another world. The dead were attacking the living, and every room, every corridor echoed with screams, horrible groans and sinister laughter. The smell of blood and the palpable heat of madness filled the air, and in the middle of all of that, Jonathan and Dio Brando fought. It was all over in a flash, right in front of my eyes. Jonathan accepted his death, but when I vowed to die with him, he pointed to baby Lisa Lisa, where she lay crying, and told me to save her and live. I couldn't refuse, so I picked up Lisa Lisa and climbed into the box. You could tell at a glance it was no ordinary box. It was a bomb shelter shaped like a coffin, large enough for an adult to climb inside. I could lock it from inside. Just before I shut the lid, I looked back, wondering if I could somehow get Jonathan inside. But he he had Dio's head wrapped tightly in his arms, and no longer had the strength to stand. Jonathan was much heavier than me. 
I could never move him in time, not with the machine room looking ready to burst at any second, and Jonathan was using his last strength to hold D.L. captive. There was no chance I could have pried D.L. loose and saved Jonathan's body alone. Be happy, Erina, he said, and his smile pushed me into the box. Think about it, Jojo, I heard D.L. cry. I can grant you eternal life. I closed the lid and locked it from inside. As I did, there was a thunderous roar, and an explosion flung the box away. Lisa Lisa was crying in my arms, and I tried not to scream. I remembered a lullaby I'd heard as a child, and I started singing that. The cushions on the inside were soft, and I had an idea it belonged to Dio, so I wasn't as worried as you might see, think. He was a clever man and would take precautions. There were several more explosions outside the box, and we were flung up, down, right and left, but the sturdy iron frame and thick cushions absorbed most of the impact. In time, the box began to bob gently. We must have fallen into the water, I thought. If anyone else survived, I would have to try and save them, I thought. So I opened the box. I knew full well that anything floating on the water might not be human at all, but one of those moving corpses. But I allowed myself to hope Jonathan's body would be floating nearby, and I had to look. I first pressed my ear against the lid trying to catch the cries and laughter of the dead. All I heard was the sound of water lapping, so I turned the key and opened the lid a crack. There was no sign of any horror. Through the gap I could see the sky. The sun had just set, and it was a beautiful shade of purple. The sea breeze slipped in with the light, and it was as if it carried all the madness and horror away with it. Relieved, I opened the lid and sat up. To my surprise, we were over a hundred metres from the remains of the ship. I looked around but saw no survivors, living or dead. I put my hand in the water, intending to paddle back to the ship. And then I saw a hand under the box. It tried to grab my arm. I recognised it. I knew that arm, that hand, those fingers. I snatched my hand out of the water and tried to close the lid again. But then I realised Lisa Lisa wasn't lying next to me. Erina Pendleton, a voice said. I turned, and the terrifying face of Dio Brando was floating on the surface of the water. Below his head was a body that had not been there a moment ago, and that big, burly body was wearing tattered, burned clothing I knew only too well. Dio must have escaped Jonathan's grip as the explosion hit and stolen his body. The grief and terror were so strong I wanted to cry, but I couldn't afford the luxury. Dio had Jonathan's feet impaled on a stick of wood embedded in the tattered side of the box. A wave of fury crossed me at the thought of him being so rough with my husband's body, but I didn't dare voice my anger. I couldn't, because what had been Jonathan's arms were crading little Lisa Lisa against what had been Jonathan's chest, and Dio Brando had his fangs bared. Or should I say Erina Joestar? he asked. Half his face had been blown away in the explosion, but that only made his half smile all the more terrifying. Dio's head seemed to be barely keeping a grip on Jonathan's shoulders. He offered me a deal. Your choice, he said. Baby Lisa Lisa's blood, or mine. I'd promised Jonathan I'd save Lisa Lisa's life. I told him if he laid a finger on him, I would pull his feet off the stake and leave him adrift in the sea. I didn't think he had the strength to fight me, and if he had, he wouldn't have needed to steal Lisa Lisa and try to bargain with me. Then there is only one answer, Dio said. I said nothing, but I knew I had to accept it. Giving baby Lisa Lisa to a vampire was not a choice I could consider. If it helps, think of it this way, Dio said. You aren't keeping me alive. You're keeping your husband's body alive. I let this pass, but made him promise not to turn me into one of those horrible living corpses. I will duly honour whoever saves my life, Dio said. The same honour I gave Jonathan Joestar, I give his wife. But the only honour he tried to give my husband on that ship was a swift and painless death. This was Dio's arrogance. I held out my arm and allowed him to feed. Then I took Lisa Lisa and rested in the box. Dio Brando was not a man prone to restraint, and had drank so much blood I could barely remain conscious. Before I shut the lid, Dio said, I thought my meeting with Jonathan Joestar was fated, but it appears destiny guided the three of us together. 
I didn't answer him. Dio spent that night struggling, in terrible pain. I heard him thrashing in the water, climbing onto the lid and dropping back into the sea, fighting for control of his body. Sometimes he yelled at it, other times he screamed like a madman, shaking the lid, and there was nothing I could do but clutch Lisa Lisa and tremble. Of course Dio was in pain. He was trying to merge with a body nothing like his own, not even the same blood type. I was a nurse, and I knew that would have been impossible for any normal human. The human body rejects foreign tissue and attacks it. If the blood type matches, a blood transfusion is possible. But organs and bones are not so easy. Trying to screw a head onto a different body was unthinkable. After a long time, I stopped hearing Dio's voice, and he stopped thrashing about. I hoped Jonathan's body had rejected Dio's head, and Dio's attempt to steal his body had failed. I hoped to find him reduced to a severed head again. I hoped his silence signalled failure. But after a long time, I heard Dio laughing, and my hopes were dashed. Jonathan's body wouldn't be released. Dio shouted, and this time I heard him clearly. The world is mine! The way to heaven! I will get there! The pride in his voice made me sick with fear. Trembling in the darkness of the box, I began wondering how I could possibly bury this devil. Before the sun rose, Dio knocked on the lid and woke me up. When I opened it, he said, Let me drink one more time before the sun rises. I held out my arm for him to drink. When he was done, he said, You must be hungry. It's hardly fair for me to gain strength while you dwindle, and I need you to keep making fresh blood. He showed me a fistful of fish he'd caught. Then he grabbed a bit of broken ship floating nearby. A light shot out of his eyes, setting the wood on fire, and he used it to cook the fish and handed them to me. I knew that light was the same thing that had stolen Jonathan's life, yet now it was saving mine. I took the fish from him, chewed them and fed them to Lisa Lisa. From her size she was only three months old. It was a gamble, but she was losing strength quickly. I had lost a lot of blood and had very little strength. I was starving, but I couldn't bear to take food from Dio. When he saw I wasn't eating myself, he said, You may not wish to eat what I provide, but if you'll feed this baby, you should feed the baby inside you as well. At the time, I had not yet realised I was pregnant, and I had been aware of a change in my body. I never expected to hear such news from him. I was shaken by this, but my feminine instincts told me he was telling the truth. When I was done feeding Lisa Lisa, I ate the rest of the fish myself. I had no choice. Eat well, make lots of blood. So much I can't drink it all. I had no intention of dictating how much blood he could drink. Our deal was made, and I had nothing further to bargain with. Dio had recovered enough he could easily kill me if the whim struck him. At any rate, the fish were delicious. My some stomach set to work and my body started making blood. I could feel my pulse growing stronger. Blood is the power that keeps us alive and gives us our strength. Not surprising it gives vampires powers humans could never have. Once I'd eaten my fill of fish, Dio began gulping down seawater. Once it has entered my body, I can change it as I please, he smirked. He turned the water from salt to fresh, then reached out his hands, slipped Jonathan's fingers into Lisa Lisa and me, just like he did to feed, and injected water into our bodies. The sun will rise soon. I can't do anything while it's out. I can't have you dying of thirst. Once the sun rises, close the lid and avoid exerting yourself in any way. The box is designed to maintain a comfortable temperature no matter what happens outside. Dio began to move back in the water, to hide under the box, but I stopped him and told him to get in the box, not in the same compartment as me and Lisa Lisa, of course. I'd worked out this box had two layers. The depth of my berth compared to that height to the outside made it clear there was room below the cushions for another person. An emergency second compartment seemed like a precaution any smart vampire would make to avoid the sunlight. Holding Lisa Lisa, I moved on to the open lid, and Dio climbed out of the water. Did you think you'd be more likely to get your chance in this box in the water, Erin Ajostar? He asked. He'd seen right from my scheme. There was nothing I could say. Underneath the box, Dio could easily escape. 
if he swam down a few dozen metres, the sun could never reach him, and he was a vampire. Obviously he could do that, but if he was in the box with me, all I had to do was open the lid and the sun would pour in. Dio knew exactly what I'd been thinking. He shook the water off and said, Let me remind you that I can kill you at any moment. I can tear that baby to pieces. I can reach into your belly, tear out that embryo, and eat it while you watch. Remember that. Remember it well. The only reason I don't is out of respect. Like I said, each tiresome scheme you attempt lowers my respect for you. If I cease to respect you, I will inflict the greatest indignity upon you. I was frozen with fear. Dio leaned close and whispered in my ear. You wanted me in the lower compartment. It was so obvious. Are you really that stupid? No one that simple-minded has any right to Jonathan's hand. These words went straight to my heart and tore right through me. You will be punished. I'll take back what the fish gave you. He shoved his fingers in my neck and drained my blood again. Our deal had ended. Whatever pretense we had of equality had crumbled in an instant. Further punishment, he said, and snatched Lisa Lisa from my arms. I was too woozy to resist. He threw me face down in the second compartment. The cushions inside were just as thick, so it didn't hurt that much. But Dio must have seen me try and shield my room. If you really are stupid, that baby will die, he said. He replaced the partition, shutting me in the bottom of the box. I heard a click a moment later, so I'd assumed he closed the lid to keep the sun out. In the darkness, I put my hand to my belly and tried desperately to stop myself from passing out. If I lost consciousness, I felt my bodily function would fade so much the baby would die. After what seemed like such a long, long, long time, I heard Dio's voice through the cushion. Don't you dare die, Erina Joestar. If you die, I'll have to eat this baby. The thought of little Lisa Lisa in his hands made me desperate to communicate I was still alive. But my voice was a hoarse whisper, and there was nothing hard to tap. Just soft cushions that absorbed all sound. You can't just make this easy, he growled, and flipped the box so it was resting upside down. Now I was lying on my back, unable to move. Right before my eyes, a small door I'd never noticed slid open, and I could see the blue sky up above. The white clouds and dazzling sunlight did wonders for my spirit, and I was able to lift myself up to the little window and peer out. Sitting on top of the box was a bird, its wings torn off and its body roasted. Eat that. Make blood, said Dio's voice behind me. I did as he said, wondering as I ate how Dio could open this window and prepare this meal without entering the sunlight. I was too dazed to think clearly and no answer came. I understood only one thing, that Dio had some power I didn't understand, and this power could grab a bird out of the sky in broad daylight, light a fire and cook it. None of that could be done while hiding a box in the water. None of that could be done without leaving the compartment, believe me, which Dio hadn't done. I devoured the bird, and once again the fresh blood came rushing through my body. At last my mind started working. The first thing I had thought that I had was that if there were birds, we mustn't be that far from land. That improved the odds of rescue, possibly in the near future. I had only to survive until then, and somehow protect Lisa Lisa that long. I had given up all hope of killing Dio at sea. I was only interested in survival. Not to save my own life, but for Lisa Lisa and the child inside me. But whatever spirit the new blood brought me was dashed away with a single war from Dio. Hey! Shut the door and get back inside the box, you awful cow! Don't let light inside my box. If you're done eating, get back in your hole, bitch! Nobody has ever spoken to me like that. I never associated with anyone who used language like that. It was as great a shock to me as being struck by lightning. But Dio didn't even allow me time to reel. I'm sick of your dainty bullshit. You could have eaten the fish and that bird war. I could have jammed them straight into your stomach rather than let you feed yourself. The only reason I didn't is out of consideration. Yet you can't even show me the same in kind. Cut the sad damn sunlight off. Such a torrent of abuse. I hastily closed the door. With it shut, all I could do was lie there in the darkness and listen to Dio rant. 
I knew nothing of true suffering. Being a nurse just proved I was a hypocrite. Deep down I was phony, slow, and a plague that drags people down the more you try to help. That's why Jonathan died, he said. The reason I had to kill Jonathan begins with you. When we were children, I just made a little pass at you, and Jonathan lost his damn mind, attacked me for no reason. That's why I had to kill him. Jonathan was a good guy. If he'd never attacked me, we would have been real friends, brothers. But you made sure that never happened. The reason Jonathan died was because you used him to get at me. You killed Jonathan Joestar. I could argue with none of this. I just stifled my voice and cried as quietly as I could. It was agonising. I wanted to yell back, but I couldn't. I was so unused to being treated like this that in the back of my mind, I started to wonder if maybe he had a point. After all, I just lost my beloved husband in a way that hardly seemed real. I wasn't in control of my emotions, and Dio took advantage of that. He didn't let me think. He kept the harassment going for hours, violently changing his manner to keep me off balance. If I started crying, he'd fall silent for a minute, then change his tone. I said I would show you respect. I'm sorry. I couldn't control my emotions. I said things I shouldn't have. Closing the door was better for you as well. Like I said, what I can do during the day is limited. If you were dehydrated, I'm not sure I could save you. So I wanted you back in the box as soon as possible, before you started to sweat. Earlier he claimed he could do nothing during the day, but he'd been able to flip the box, cook a bird and feed it to me. I was too afraid to challenge him on this. His behaviour was bizarre, unstable and predictable. The more Dio told me how everything he did was for me, the more I apologised. Saying what he wanted to hear, I shouldn't have thought of that. I'm so sorry. All I wanted to do was get him to stop blaming me, then explaining how I'd betrayed his respect and enraged him. But apologising just made him change tactics again. You're sorry? Sorry for what? You don't even know what you're apologising for. Are you mocking me? I'm showing you respect, and you're ignoring it! The hidden door flew open, and I was dragged out of the box. How he did this, I didn't know. Something grabbed a handful of my clothing, but I couldn't see what. This invisible thing threw me into the water. We'd been on our honeymoon, and I was dressed for dinner. In an instant, it was soaked through and heavy, and tangled with my limbs. I couldn't swim in that, not as weak as I was. I sank like a stone. Dio left me until I'd nearly drowned. Then his invisible power yanked me out of the box again, and put me in the box. I coughed up water, shaking, and he demanded I show remorse. I said anything he wanted me to say, desperate not to get thrown in the water again. Then his voice turned sweet again. He explained how worthless I was, how much I deserved to be drowned, or have him feed on my blood, how all of this was done for my benefit out of kindness. He fed me enough to restore what he drank, and then began screaming at me again over nothing. By noon I was completely under his control. I didn't want him to drown me, didn't want him to drink from me, and nothing else mattered. Then for some imagined slight, the old demanded I choose between drowning or having my blood drained. Letting him feed was far less painful, but I was worried about the baby, so I had to choose being thrown in the ocean. For most of the day he tortured me with the water, and between he would feed. Either punishment pushed me to the brink of death, but he'd always forced me back to life. Sometimes I genuinely wish he'd let me die, but Lisa Lisa and the baby inside me kept me alive. I wanted to survive. I had to survive. I would do anything to survive. Before the sun set, all traces of my identity had been destroyed, and without even seeing Dio Brando once throughout the whole ordeal, I even agreed to marry him. No matter what I did, I could not please him. The fear was so overwhelming, I nearly vomited every time I heard his voice, but he'd drop me in the water if he noticed, so I had to put my face under water and throw up as quietly as I could. Dio's punishments and assaults continued. I wasn't allowed to rest safely in the box. I became dehydrated and then sunsick. I was running a fever, unable to think, unable to understand what was happening to me. I didn't even know who I was. Dio had denied me everything. When the sun sank below the horizon, Dio opened the lid of the box and appeared before me. He'd been sipping my blood since sunrise and his burns had almost completely healed.
His skin and hair were glossy, and against the clouds of dusk he appeared to be a very handsome man indeed. My eyes did not see Dio Brando, but someone who owned me completely. I was his toy to do with as he pleased. There was a part of me oddly pr proud that my owner was so beautiful. His strange power held me just above the surface of the water. Dio looked down at me and smiled. You're wet, filthy, ugly, and good for nothing but your blood. While I allow you to live, give me all the blood you have. You don't have my permission to die. Beneath that crimson sky, I at last saw Dio for who he was. My mind finally realised the man standing there was Dio Brando. And I remembered. I was Erin a Joestar. My maiden name was Erin a Pendleton. And I realised one other thing. During the day, when Dio had been placing me under his control, I had wondered if he desired me as a woman. But of course he didn't. He was Dio Brando. Even when he'd been rough with me to tear Jonathan and me apart, he never actually cared about me. He'd simply been trying to isolate Jonathan. I'd simply been a tool, a pawn to make that happen. Even though he now he had not broken my spirit because he wanted me, he didn't care about me. Not ten years ago and not now. Sitting on the lid, Dio used his mysterious power to bring me closer to him and turned me upside down, dangling in the air. Give your new husband a kiss, he sneered. Of your own free will. Make it a good one and I might give you water and food. No sooner had the words left his mouth than my hand shot out and slapped him across the face. I scarcely even knew what I, that I was smiling. I can't do that. There's no muddy water to wash my lips with. I'll refrain from explaining what I meant by that, but resisting him like this, as strung out as I was, seemed to catch Dio off guard. He looked surprised and didn't react immediately. It was but a moment, but I had time to think. He was the same man he'd been ten years before. His core hadn't changed. He was doing the same thing, repeating what had happened ten years ago. He was dominating me to isolate Jonathan, to make him feel powerless. He wanted Jonathan to see what he was doing to me, so Jonathan must be close enough to see me. Dio Brando had been a vampire without a body. He'd stolen Jonathan Joestar's body. So what had happened to his head? Had he left it on the ship, with his obsessive nature? Of course not. He would have taken it with him, and then humiliated his wife in front of it. That was the sort of monster he was, and he had the power to keep Jonathan alive, even as a severed head. Dio Brando was a vampire, and he turned the ship's passengers into living corpses. He must have done the same thing to Jonathan. He turned him into one of those horrible monsters from the ship. This thought made me shake with sadness and fear, but it also gave me strength. I took my eyes off Dio and looked around me, trying not to betray my intent. There are any number of ship fragments floating near us. The waves have not drawn them away. This seemed odd. Odd enough. Was Dio's strange power keeping them here? He wasn't just keeping them in case he needed a fire. If he wanted that, he could have moved the number of them into the box, or used his power to pile them up on top of the lid and let them dry. I'd watched him lighting the wet, wet wood, and it took a considerable amount of time. So he wasn't keeping them floating here for use as firewood, but to hide something underneath. Just as Dio had hidden beneath the box, I looked again, searching for something large enough to hide Jonathan's head. But before I could find it, Dio reached his hand out and wrapped it round my throat. Your tongue is sharp, Heron Joestar. <laughs> so be it. The night has just begun. I can take my time and let you know just how dull you are and just how pathetic your violent outburst was. I stared at him in silence, thinking. A few moments ago I'd been so terrified of him. But not any more. Not now Jonathan was at my side. Jonathan was here with me. That thought alone made me live again. It didn't matter if he was a monster or the living dead. Jonathan was Jonathan, my husband. I wouldn't allow myself to grovel before another man with him watching. I knew Dio would continue to torment me. Even if Jonathan had become a monster, if any trace of humanity remained within him, he wouldn't want to see me treated like this. But he'd no way of escaping, unless somebody allowed him to die. As his wife, that was my duty. 
This was an awful thought, but I felt certain Jonathan would not be able to bear turning into one of those ugly monsters I'd seen on the ship. So my first order of business became escaping from the grip of whatever power kept me suspended in the air. That was easy enough, as long as I could bear the pain. When Dio had this power to throw, throw me into the ocean, it often left me to my own devices, especially if it was sure I was too exhausted to swim. My spirit might have returned, but the fear was still very strong. It was, was all I could do not to tremble or throw up. But I managed to look calm hold it long enough to say, Hold your tongue. You are no longer human and have no right to speak that way to me. Dio's grin vanished. Not that you had any right to speak to me when you were human. You spoke and lived and behaved like a gentleman on the surface, but you never were one. You have an inferiority complex about your impoverished origins, and that prevents you from improving yourself as a human. Let me tell you, Dio Brando, your poverty did not make you a villain. Your relationship with your parents did not make you what you are. Lack of education or wealth had no bearing. You were doomed by your own inability to look beyond the surface of anything, by your shallow mind and by your overwhelming self-importance. As I spoke these words, I realised I wasn't just trying to make him mad. I meant every word and genuinely believed I was speaking the truth. And Dio's reaction made it clear I'd touched a nerve. For several moments, he remained shaken. Then he yelled, Shut up, you bitch! And used his mysterious power to shove me under the water. When I had almost drowned, it yanked me out. He yelled at me again, and shoved me back under so hard I almost passed out. But I couldn't afford to lose consciousness here. I desperately shook off the blackness, opened my eyes underwater, and looked for Jonathan. But there were so many bubbles around my body I could barely see. As soon as the bubbles began to thin, I was yanked out of the water. Dio's fury, or rather his consternation, was tremendous, and I was in and out of the water, swallowing it and coughing it up so fast the water coming in and the water coming up met in the back of my throat and formed a whirlpool. I had no choice but to endure it, though it was hardly endurable. But I had to keep myself conscious and alive. I nearly suffocated on the seawater and vomit, but just before I did, Dio's power let go. I was flung a good ten metres away and hit the water with a thunderous splash, and sank into the churn of the ocean. As I cleared my throat, I caught a glimpse of something under the debris near the box. My husband's head, Jonathan Joestar's head, bobbing up and down. It was far away, and I couldn't make out what kind of monster he'd become, but peering through the murky waters, I knew. I, had, I knew I had to do my duty as his wife and kill my husband. I knew this was my one and only chance to act. I had to do it while I was far away from Dio and the box, before he noticed what I was up to. My body and mind couldn't take much more torture. I wouldn't physically be able to act much longer. Further violence would almost certainly lead me to lose myself again, become Dio's toy, and allow myself to suffer all manner of indignities with Jonathan watching. I wanted to avoid that at all costs. So I surfaced. Coughed violently, emptying both stomach and lungs, and then pretended to faint, allowing myself to sink beneath the water. I knew Dio wouldn't pull me out immediately, and I guessed he was so angry that he would probably leave me to drown until the last possible moment. Once I was a few metres below the surface, I began to swim as fast as I could. I was never the best swimmer, and my dress was heavy and made it hard to move at all, but I thrashed my arms and legs with all my might, desperate to reach Jonathan and kill him. At last I reached Jonathan, and my resolve proved to be for naught. Floating beneath the remains of the ship, in water still tinged orange from the sunlight, was the head of my beautiful, beloved Jonathan Joestar. Not a monster, but looking for all the world like he was still alive. No matter what he'd become, after a day in the water, I expected the head's flesh to have decayed, his skin nibbled away by fish. So this miraculous sight made me gasp. I was transfixed. I had been so focused on laying my monstrous husband to rest. And he not only wasn't a monster, he didn't even look dead. Hesitantly, I reached out my hand and touched Jonathan's head. The living corpses on the ship had growled furiously, attacking anything living indiscriminately. But Jonathan's eyes remained slightly open, not looking at me, not trying to bite me, 
not moving at all. I took him in my arms and held him close, feeling the softness of his hair against my cheek. My husband was so different from what I had expected that I lingered too long, and Dio's mysterious power found me. It grabbed me by the collar and yanked me out of the water. You knew Jonathan was down there? Dio roared. You fool! Do you want your husband to eat you? This and the panic in his voice surprised me, but Jonathan's head was cradled in my arms, smiling gently, saying nothing. He didn't seem like he would ever attack me. Perhaps even more surprising was that Dio tried to yank Jonathan away from me, as if trying to rescue me from him. No! he yelled, and that invisible hand of his tried to snatch Jonathan from my arms. We struggled for control of him for a moment, but he soon stopped trying. The hand let go, I got my arms back tightly around the head, and then I turned around to find Dio staring at Jonathan. What's going on? he whispered. Clearly, Dio found Jonathan's condition as surprising as I did. I could never have killed Jonathan with him still looking this beautiful, but from Dio's reaction, it seemed I might not have to. The relief was so great I nearly fainted. But if I fainted, there was no telling what Dio might do to Jonathan, so I persevered. Dio set us down on the lid of the box, where he and Lisa Lisa stood. Jonathan, how long will you pursue me? How long will our fates remain entwined? He muttered, glaring at Jonathan's head. I knew the danger wasn't yet over. Indeed, Jonathan's arrival had sent Dio into a fit. I won't allow it. He'll get in my way again. I can leave no part of him. Erin and Joe Star, he's already dead. I knew I had to protect my husband's head until this passed. I grabbed the piece of driftwood and turned to face Dio. I won't let you touch Jonathan, I cried. I put the sharp end to my throat and stabbed it into the side of my neck, piercing my jugular. As, I ner as a nurse, I knew this wound was fatal. I had dug deeply to ensure it would be. I drew the jagged piece of wood all the way around, across my windpipe and opened the other vein. I needed to release a great quantity of blood at once. Blood filled my vision, spraying out in arcs. I could feel it coating my shoulders, warm and wet. Good, I thought. The wound had to be deep enough to kill me instantly. Dio screamed. What are you doing, you stupid bitch? <laughs> I'm pretty sure I laughed out loud. He was so predictable. I knew it. I knew Dio couldn't kill me. The first sign was when he tried to separate me and Jonathan. He believed Jonathan was a monster and tried to rescue me. Given Dio's obsession with Jonathan, his unnatural fixation on causing him grief, then letting Jonathan eat me seemed like something he would welcome, or at least not stop immediately. But in that instant, he blurted out his true feelings. What with the blood gushing out of my neck, I swiftly lost consciousness, but eventually I woke up again. Dio had given me blood and used his power to heal the wound on my neck. I was woken by the sound of Lisa Lisa crying and found Dio collapsed next to me. He'd injected me with most of the blood he'd drunk, and while he remained conscious, he was as weak as he'd been when he first emerged from the box. Perhaps even worse. This time he didn't even have the strength to take Lisa Lisa hostage. He'd come close to sacrificing himself to save me, and he looked relieved to see me awake again. I first checked the condition of my wound. As far as I could tell, the gash on my throat had been sewn together, the work as fine as any surgeon. Despite myself, I was impressed. Where did you learn to do this? I asked. Slumped against the corner of the box, Dio glanced at me and rasped. In a book. I liked reading. I read all kinds of things, taught myself anything that might be useful. For the first time, I felt I understood just how alone Dio had always been. Outwardly, Dio had been surrounded by friends, the life of the party. He would never seemed like someone who would have time to read. But now I could imagine him slipping away early. His friendships were shallow, for appearances only. Alone he had nothing to do but read. Nothing Dio's ambition granted him was real. He had no one he could share his real feelings with. Nothing he'd genuinely accomplished with his own two hands. His life was hollow. This, I thought, was why he'd been so fixated on Jonathan. Jonathan was stuffed full where Dio was empty. He'd grown up to be a man who made genuine friends he could honestly share his emotions with 
a man who threw himself body and soul into everything he did. Growing up in the same house with that, how could Dio not compare himself to Jonathan? The frustration this comparison caused him was perhaps the one genuine emotion he ever felt. And because he was unused to such emotion, he grew confused and was driven to kill Jonathan and steal his body. If he wanted to be like Jonathan, he should have just told people how he felt and made himself a true friend. The life he'd led before joining the Joe Stars had made Dio Brando who he was, and true friendship was almost certainly an impossibility for him. But Jonathan Joestar was not the sort of man to push someone away just because they'd committed a crime. If he'd allowed his feelings to show, some solution would have been found. Thinking about it, it occurred to me Dio had been expressing those emotions as clearly as he knew how. Hurting Jonathan, trying to kill him, these were a backhanded way of expressing his admiration. Had he felt that for anyone but Jonathan, he would never have admitted it. I'd seen the results of their conflict myself, and was seeing it now, here on this little box. One had become a severed head, and I couldn't even tell if he was alive or dead. The other had become a vampire, and stolen his rival's body, but had given his blood to save that rival's wife, placing himself at the brink of death as well. I hugged Jonathan's head to me, looked over at Dio, and found myself shedding tears for both of them. I was overcome with sadness, grief and pain. I made no attempt to wipe the tears away, letting them roll down my cheeks. His voice hoarse, Dio asked, Are you going to kill me? I will not, I said. Do you cry because you pity me? He asked. You may have saved my life, but I can never pity you. I just wondered why you and Jonathan had to end up like this, and I couldn't stop myself. It was fated, Dio said. Does it have something to do with the way to heaven? I asked. He made a face. You heard that. Damn it. If I could kill you, I would. Is not killing me a condition for getting to heaven? He didn't answer. Instead, he said, Do you know what blood is? When I didn't answer, Dio said, Blood is power, Erin Joestar. Make blood to live. This is good for me. And what is good for me is good for you. Dio knew. He knew the wicked thought that had entered my head when I held Jonathan in my arms. Her long, long story drawing to a close, Mum looked at Lisa Lisa. I could have killed Dio Brando there and then, but I didn't. When the night ended, I put Dio in the bottom compartment, and when a ship rescued us, I had them weigh the box down and sink it. This is my sin. I couldn't kill Dio, even though I would have killed Jonathan if he'd been a monster. You see, I had hope. Hope? What part of this story led to hope? Lisa Lisa's face was grim. Not hope that Dio would regret his actions and become a better person. That man is incapable of such a thing. Then what kind of hope? Mum turned to look at my father's head. But as long as Dio is alive, then Jonathan's body is too. I felt a bolt of electricity run down my spine. Her eyes locked on my father. Mum said, Jonathan is not dead, and I didn't want to lose the chance to get his body back. I believed that day would come, and I've been waiting here, in the hope that it would. This was why Mum had started living in the Canary Islands, never returning home to England. She wanted to remain with Father's head, near the sea where his body slumbered. But this also meant Dio Brando was still alive, and the only way anyone could ever get a chance to get Father's body back was if they faced him directly. Even if he was locked in a box on the brink of death, he was a vampire, and from what Mum told us, even without moving his body, he had some strange power that allowed him to do all manner of horrible things to her. He seemed incredibly dangerous. Mum Erina, Lisa Lisa said. This mysterious power Dio had. It seems to have shown up when he stole George's father's body. That's not a power vampires have, and he didn't do anything like that when he was fighting George's father. Then you're most likely correct. That first night, when Dio was outside the box, he seemed confused. That might have something to do with it. Hmm. Uh, powers like that. Some people are born with them, and others get them after something dramatic happens, or an injury or the like. The Hamon Masters call these Spirit Hamon, or Stands. A strange name, but people with these power can see the power standing next to them, like a ghost. 
so I don't think Dio was confused that night. You make it sound like he tried talking to it, and tried fighting with it. In other words, he saw this ghost-like thing and didn't know what it was. Stands often look like people. Mum was hardly in a position to know for sure. Her story done, the three of us went upstairs. Penelope looked terrified and threw her arms around me, refusing to let go. So many people died! George, I'm scared! This island is a scary place! Huh? I was scared too, and the way Lisa Lisa was looking at us was scarier. But what was scariest was a fire that had broken out in the one church on La Palma, in which 70 people perished. Why they were in the church in the middle of the night, nobody knew. But the doctor who treated my wounds had been there, and Lisa Lisa said everyone who died there had seen the man with black wings, the man who looked like a moth. And the walls of the burned down church were covered in drawings of a man with giant wings who looked just like their descriptions. When the sun rose, we went to the church. So this is the moth man, Lisa Lisa said. I shuddered. Don't give it a scary name. I didn't make it up. Still, I couldn't stop shaking. Every wall of the burned out church was covered in pictures of the moth man. Countless pictures. Before the fire had started, everyone there must have been frantically covering the walls in drawings. The very thought sent a chill down my spine. These are drawn in the ash from the fire. They were using their own fingers as charcoal sticks. These people had been turned into zombies and drew these pictures before the fire killed them again. Even though Penelope was still clinging to me, I'm pretty sure I let a drop of pee loose. Just one, I swear. It may well be this happened because we're here, Mum said. George, let us return to England. You can come too, Penelope. Huh? Seriously? Really? I can come too, Irina? Penelope cried. I'd love to. George, say I can come. Of course. I was pleased as punch. I could finally leave this awful island. But are you sure? About leaving father's body? I'm sure when the time comes, we'll be brought together. Whether I'm living close by, or far away. That's the power we have. Blood is power. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 The Island Chaos reigned. The electric and phone lines had been severed, so there was no TV to watch, and the landlines were useless, but our cell phones were still working. Probably not for much longer, though. Moria was heading out onto the ocean, heading south from Japan at the insane speed of a hundred knots, much faster than most ships could manage. We'd be out of our provider's coverage area in no time. I first used mine to check the news. The anchor said the SDF had scrambled planes to follow Morio. I looked up just in time to see six of them rocketing towards us. Two were larger transport planes, but four of them were clearly fighters. Guarding the transport planes? I suppose they'd scramble fighter planes either way, I thought. Then the lead F-22 exploded. We cried out and watched as the fire spread out flat, like it was exploding against an invisible dome ceiling, which I guess it was. There was a dome up there. The burning plane slid up along the dome moving southwest, then slowed. For a second it stopped right above us, then began sliding down to the southeast, bits of it spiralling off to either side. The trail of it made the shape of the dome clear. The other five planes managed to pull up in time and avoided crashing into the dome. The burning plane hit the water with a splash, but that was soon swallowed in the wake left by the great ship Morio as it sailed across the water. The wake churned outside the walls of the dome. Did it wrap all the way around underneath? Is this a stand? I asked Rohan. I don't know. I've never seen or heard of a stand this large. The whole town's an island. Stands you see belong to a person. They're a person's individual power. There's a limit to what even the best of us can accomplish. We all have our limits, right? Or is my faith in limits betraying my own mediocrity? Damn it, I've never been this shocked in all my life. Is this really what mankind is capable of? Rohan's answer had drifted into a thought, which had turned into a sort of speech directed at himself, which was alarming. As an artist, I could see my mediocrity would be Rohan's greatest fear, and why he'd want to deny that humans have limits. But this didn't seem to be an idea worth this level of conniptions. We still didn't know what was actually happening. Perhaps Stan Masters knew less about their own powers than they believed, or perhaps they were too ready to assume anything unusual was the result of a stand. Perhaps this is more than a stand, Rohan said. If so, let us call it beyond. 
Uh, sorry, I said. That name's already taken. What? It is. Authors were frightening. Such synchronicity. Then I had an idea, and asked Rohan about Sukumajuku. If he found someone dead in his house, he must have read them of Heaven's Door. Sukumajuku? Of course I took a look, but there was nothing to learn. Once someone dies, their book becomes the kanji for death, repeated to infinity. Behind him, Nijimura Murio Taisu started shouting. Ah, what the hell are they doing? Jesus! I followed his gaze, looking up, and saw one of the fighter planes coming back and firing a missile parallel to the Earth's surface. But the missile exploded in mid-air, the fire and shrapnel spreading out, flat on one side. Like the plane before it, the missile had hit the side of the dome. They'd simply been verifying the existence of it. If the dome hadn't been there, the missile would have passed harmlessly through the air over Morio. The plane that had fired the missile pulled up sharply, avoided the dome, and flew away. Are we protected then? Muriel Taisu said. Who knows? Rohan said. But I don't think this dome is entirely beneficial to us. Look over there. He pointed down the hill to Morio Harbour. A chunk of the bay was being moved with the town itself as part of the ship. A great number of boats had set off from the harbour headed for the edge of the ship. They're about to find that out, Rohan added. Rohan was right. We all were. Not one of the boats was able to pierce the dome. They'd all had the sense to slow down as they approached the edge and avoided significant damage to their vessels. But we could see the fisherman clustered at the brat prow, poking the dome with harpoons. It made the line of the dome very clear. The wakes of the ships crashed against the curve of the dome, a gentle circle encircling the bay. A circle, hmm? Rohan, do you have a map of Morio? A map? Of course not. But I can draw you one. Eh? Rohan pulled out a notepad and, notepad and pen out of his pocket, and I watched as he went, shh, 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 drawing a very accurate-looking map. I suppose I had no reason to object. You still don't trust my power, do you? Rohan said. I only need to see a thing one time to produce a detailed sketch from memory. I promise this is accurate. I took the map, had Heros fly up and verified the line of the dome in the bay from above, did a little calculating, and soon knew the shape of the ship. The edge was a perfect circle in the water, but followed the winding boundary lines of the town on land. It struck me I'd seen the shape before. I was, it wasn't quite right, but... I recognised it. From where? I couldn't remember. I racked my brain, but nothing came out, so I went back to my original reasons for making the map. I had a theory. Since the dome formed a circle in the harbour, the circle was centred on something. If this ship was really the work of an individual... We have to go here, Rohan said, pointing at the circle. If this power is centred here, whoever's moving Morio will be there as well. What's located there? That's our, that's our school. Budogalka Academy, said Nijimura. Fukushigi. What? He wasn't underground anymore. Oh, you're okay, Murio Taisu cried. Behind Fukushigi I saw Sugimoto Raimi and the disgruntled looky Rohan Kashibi. Right, there were two Rohans. I turned, but the one next to me had vanished. The ghost was flesh again. Kira Yoshikage has cancelled Killer Queen's Bites the Dust effect. Sugimoto Remy explained. We could finally say the name aloud. He must have realised the trap he'd sprung on Rohan would be enough to eliminate his enemies, which means he's preparing to fight us head on. Why this timing? Unless, is Kira Yoshikage the one moving Morio? Rohan asked. Hmm, hard to see it any other way. Rohan, all these detectives have been calling you today, right? Yes, I got fed up and stopped answering the phone. Look what's on TV. Remy held out a cell phone, where a group of detectives were holding an emergency press conference. She'd found a live stream of it. A row of detectives stood behind a long table with a white cloth and a number of microphones. The blonde man in the centre was holding a mic and speaking rapidly. We have little time, so let's get right down to it. First, some introductions. Including myself, the 13 individuals gathered here at All Known Detectives. Each has investigated and solved a number of cases, whether police or civil. Some of them I'm sure you know, but I'll take the liberty of giving their names anyway. My name is Barria Chamaru. From the right, we have the Zumi style, Yugari Bobohiko, Chokuji Kenraku, Chokuji Kiyu, 
Judy Dollhouse, Mame Gen, Mikami Nils, Barame Zero, Suki Shimoni Now, Hidzuki, Kakichu Mama Jump, and Fuyu Name Satoru. Couldn't make them any harder to say, could you? For the moment, that's all of us. I say for the moment because it seems likely more detectives will join the effort to solve the case in Morio. The case I'm referring to concerns the murders of three detectives, Hakuku Sachiari, Neko Neko Nyan Nyan Nyan, and Keito Sukumajuku. Hakuku and Neko Neko are known to be detectives, and it seems likely Keito was as well. If three detectives have been murdered in a single day, it seems clear this is an act that flies in the face of justice, of our efforts to unearth the truth and force criminals into the open. I'd even go so far as to call it an act of terrorism against the detective profession. We are here to announce no true detective would ever be swayed by such cowardly violence. This case will be solved. But Morio has broken off from Japan and is speeding out into the ocean, propelled by some mysterious power, and even the SDF are unable to approach it. Morio has become an island and the killer's trapped on it. We believe this broadcast will reach Morio and we offer first our prayers for the safety of its citizen. We are sure the mayor of Morio, Shishimura Denta, is acting swiftly in the interests of public safety and civil order. And there's one other individual I'd like to carefully address. Barry Achimaru paused dramatically. I'd seen him on TV a number of times. He was the detective and an Italian chef. I gulped. Kira Yoshikage. The detectives here know you were not the one who killed Hakyoku, Neko Neko, or Kato. We know those three were killed specifically to draw the attention of other detectives. Their deaths were bait. The real killer deliberately killed them to put you in a corner and to make you suffer. So please calm yourself, Kira Yoshikage. At this time, we are not looking for you, but for the one who killed these detectives. If you can provide any assistance, our investigation will be over faster, and you'll be able to demonstrate you can be cooperative. We promise no ill will befall you. We promise we will not attempt to find you as long as the detective killer is at large. So please, calm down. Wow, I said, before I could stop myself. How did these other detectives know that name? If they had been drawn to this case by the murders of the detectives, they shouldn't have heard anything about Kiri or Chicago. I knew they hadn't been involved in the 15 locked room mysteries, but had they all come across his name while investigating unrelated cases of their own? Received the challenge the same way I had, telling them he'd killed them if they came near Morio? I was pretty impressed they'd managed to work out he was probably moving Morio without even coming here. They must already know Stans existed, and know what they were capable of. If they didn't, they would have assumed someone had made a giant engine and fuel tank underneath the town, turning it into a giant ship. Whether that was possible was highly unlikely, but they would have started with physical theories, ignoring the possibility of superpowers entirely. But without coming here, Barrier Chomaru had known the truth. I wondered if he had friends who had come here. I was here. Moving alone or in small groups, it was very likely other detectives had reached Morio before the dome cut it off from the outside world. Barry Achimaru had been able to put together a press conference with 13 detectives on such short notice, because those detectives had all been in contact with each other. I'd always operated independently, and never had any contact with other detectives, but there were of course people who had no problem working in groups like that. So if they had friends in town, where were they? Not that I wanted to join up with them immediately, but it seemed sensible to be aware of their location. I remembered what Tsukumajuku had said. If several detectives are on the case, and one solves the case before the other does, is the slower one still a detective? Having that irritating question nagging at my backside the whole time would be a real pain. I'd have to find the other detectives and keep my distance from them so we could avoid bumping into each other. So I wondered... The person who'd be bringing all these detectives here, and threatening Kira Yoshikage. What did that person make of this place abruptly fleeing Japan? Could this have been the expected reaction? The more I thought about it, the more that seemed possible. If the possession of detectives tormented the explosion killer, if their arrival wounded him. I remembered what Tsukumajuku had said. I've begun to believe that continual repetitive suffering can lead to the development of unusual powers that help the sufferer escape. Apparently everyone had only one stand, but that didn't prevent someone from developing a new power. This thought led me to finally understand why Barry Chamaru had addressed Kira directly. 
He knew if he could ease that pain even a little, if he could make the presence of these detectives no longer hurt him, the power driving Moriel might disappear. He must have detectives posted here working on the case. Can you believe this? Fukushigi said. I followed the Nijimori brothers' gaze again and looked up. An SDF helicopter had flown up the invisible dome, and soldiers were rappelling down to the surface of it. It was terrifying to watch. I don't know. Should I go help? Hiro said, putting blue thunder on his head again. Nah, the mid Nijimura said. If some kid comes flying up to them, they'll just lose their shit. Let them be. They're grown men. They know what they're doing. I guess. We ought to head to school. It's a dude moving the towns there. And it's Kira. We can finally catch him. But it's a week, though. Summer vacation starts tomorrow. I mean, there'll be students everywhere. None of those, none of the students or teachers are named Kira Yoshikage. Kira's scared shitless with all these detectives here. We just find the guy who looks scared. But he's been murdering people here for ages without getting caught. I don't think he'll be that easy. Hiro's definitely had a point, I thought. And it reminded me of a question I'd been meaning to ask. Um, it might be a little late, but how do you all know Kira's name without ever capturing him? I just got here, and couldn't actually say his name aloud, so I never got a chance. But how do you know his name? Or that he even exists? Hiroz answered. Kira Yoshikage. Well, it seems like he had a thing for women's beautiful hands. We had a friend named Yangu Shigechi. His stand stray dog could control all the stray dogs in town. One day, one of his dogs came back carrying a hand in his mouth. One of the hands Kira Yoshikage had been toying with. The nail polish on the women's hand was unusual enough. We were able to figure out where it was sold, and that had been purchased by a man, which was unusual enough that we learned his name. We almost caught him once. But the first of us to reach him was me, and he was sure he could kill me and escape. So he took the time to explain his stand name and power. I nearly did die, but the Nijimoras caught up just in time and turned the tables on him. Just as we almost had him, he slipped away. He forced another friend of ours, Suji Aya, to use her power. Her stand, face off. What did they just face? Oh. Could switch the faces and fingerprints of any two people. So Kira grabbed a random passerby with a similar build and had her switch their appearances. He stole everything that could identify him. We got there just in time to see the other man in Suji Aya explode. He killed Shigechi too, as a warning. So as much as we wanted to make our town safe again, we also want revenge. Yeah, we're doing this for Shigechi and Suji Aya. If we stop shooting our mouths off and do something, he'll have to take action. Time to shut up and put up. We gotta go if we wanna get anywhere, Fukushigi roared, and it was suddenly flung five metres away. Surprised, I looked around. It wasn't an enemy that had hit him, but the corner of the cross house. It spun to the left. If the compass had turned, the island must have changed direction. I looked up. The soldier hanging from the helicopter had lost his balance, or the island's change in direction had changed the winds over the dome and forced the helicopter off course. Either way, the line was cut, and the soldier was sliding along the dome. Murio Taisu was focused on his brother, but Hiroz had looked up too, and saw what was happening. Crap, he said, revved blue thunder and shot into the air. I grabbed Muriel Taisu and pointed. I'll help your brother. You, held, you help him up there. Jesus, he said, looking up finally. Gotcha. Cool. He hopped aboard one of his flying dolphins and flew away, and I ran down the slope. You okay? Rohan called, coming after me. Fukushigi sat up, pushing the bushes out of his way and muttered, This house has it in for me. He was unharmed, but not because he was tough. He would used his stand to protect himself. It was sitting underneath him. NYPD Blue was an odd-looking stand, a chubby, bald, middle-aged man in a suit. Get your fat ass off of me, goddammit! He snarled. I jumped, taken aback, but Fukushigi was used to it. Yeah, yeah, he said, getting to his feet. You're useless otherwise. Least you could do is protect me. Shut your cornhole, cocksucker! You watch your fucking mouth or I'll rip your goddamn head off. Wow, this thing is a foul mouth. But Fukushigi just laughed him off. I guess it was none of my business. But then he turned and glared at me. 
Who do you think you're staring at? <laughs> I quickly looked away. Jesus. <laughs> Sorry, man. He's pretty much always in a bad mood. He thinks he's a New York cop. Uh, he's convinced I brought him back from America with me. <laughs> That's funny to you, is it, scumbag? NYPD Blue yelled. I jumped again. The smile wiped off my face. Then Hirose and Muyo Taisu came back. This is bad. Listen up, Hirose said, flustered. We couldn't break the barrier or help at all, but he gave us a message for the town's leader. Top secret. He said to tell nobody else. Apparently there's some bad people here. So, what was the message? Fukushigi asked. He said if nothing changes, the American army will flip the island. What? I thought they were our allies. Not every day a long cult wearing delinquent discusses international diplomacy, but he had a point. Back up a minute. Why should we believe that? I said, almost to myself. But Hirose heard me. Because of who gave me that message. Look at this, he said, holding out his cell phone. He'd taken a picture of a soldier holding up a note, saying, If nothing changes, the American army will flip this island, written in Japanese by a hand clearly not used to the characters. But the soldier in question was much older than I'd expected, and I'd recognised those blonde curls. That's exactly the former President of the United States, Funny Valentine. It was certainly him. Five people had been President since Valentine, and he had to be more than 80 years old. I was surprised to see him alive at all, much less clearly in good health. He looked much, much younger. His hair's still perfect. I was surprised too, but it's a wig. He's kept the wrinkles at bay with Botox and plastic surgery, apparently. But that doesn't matter. A former president is telling us this will happen. We have to believe him, right? Right, he'd taken the picture as proof. But why is Valentine here in person? On an SDF helicopter? Putting himself in danger? you think he could just talk to the funniest directly. This is where it gets stupid. Alright guys, this is the moment. The funniest Valentine was the first person in history to be named Dee, and was the current president of the United States. He was Funny's grandson. Funny's son had been named Funnier Valentine, and he'd named his son the Funniest Valentine. Funny was an astronaut, still in active service at the age of 50. He'd been on the news a lot recently, since he was the pilot for the first ever manned flight to Mars. <coughs> I wasn't sure what was going on with the Valentines, but if the funniest plan to attack Morio wasn't Funny's action of betrayal. I looked up. Whoa, I said. Funny's still up there. Funny Valentine was having trouble getting back on the helicopter. I could still see him standing up there. <sighs> He'll be fine, Rohan said, pointing at the corner of the picture on Hirose's phone. I looked closer and could just make out what looked like a frogman. Small, transparent, standing on two legs. He's got a stand, Rohan said. Okay, sure, if he's got a stand, he'll be fine, we all nodded. Then shuddered as the implications of that dawned on us. The former president of the United States was a stand master, and stands were genetic, so the current president probably was too. Ah! Fukushigi said. So I looked up again. Funny Valentine had just been knocked off the dome ceiling and was rocketing away when he suddenly stopped in midair, no rope or anything. Then he began zigzagging through the air up to the helicopter and vanished inside. Man, I hope the SDF people are okay, Hirel said. Hopefully seeing a stand in action won't lead to them being silenced. I doubt the risk would be worth it, Rohan said. The helicopter pilot's a soldier. Anything happens to him, it'll make waves. I'm sure Valentine's got an excuse in mind. It was all for pretty quick, and his soldiers have no way of understanding what happened. The helicopter flew away. In the distance, we heard a loudspeaker. This is a message from the Morial Council. In two hours at 6pm, there will be an emergency meeting. All citizens should gather at the Budogolka Gymnasium. This is a message from the Morial Council. A council van with a loudspeaker attached was slowly winding its way towards the harbour. If they were gathering citizens for an emergency meeting, Mayor Shishimura Dento would be there too, at Budogolka High School. That's where we thought the man moving Morio was, where Kira Yoshikage was. Everyone's pointing to the same place, Rohan said. We should go. There's nothing we can do here but watch my house beat up Fukushigi. Shut up! Will you be okay alone, Sugimoto?
Remy smiled. Thank you, but I'll be fine. Sorry. Being a stand, I can't leave this place. We'll go find Kira, take him down and be back before you know it. I didn't think it would be that easy, and Sugimoto looked like she agreed. But all she said was, I'll be waiting. Try not to do anything dangerous. I'll expect you back in one piece. She was a beautiful girl, and I was suddenly very jealous. How sweet! How sweet! You're a lucky man, Rohan! Not just the Nijimura brothers. Hiroz was making fun of Rohan too. Rohan turned bright red. Sh shut up! I was only being polite to my housemate. Come on! But something about the warm, fuzzy mood disturbed me. It didn't feel right, somehow. For no reason at all. But I felt like Rohan looked ready to cry. Uh, I'm not actually a stand master or anything, so maybe I should stay here? I suggested. Rohan looked surprised. What are you talking about? You're the detective. You have to solve the case. You have to go after the killer. There's already been a murder here. The police have come and gone. You've arrived. Kira's bites the dust was listed. What else is there to do? It's time for a change of locale, surely. Things were pointing that way, but I couldn't explain why I found myself wanting to stay here. I've got a hunch, I said grimly. Sure, it's not just nerves. Stand battles do get rather physical. They are dangerous. But we'll do the fighting. You just work your mind. Seems like you're a real detective. I'm sure you can find Kira for us. I mean, he turned me into a bomb, and I still have no idea who he is. Egg on my face, as the saying goes. I'm not proud of that, but I won't let it get me down. I'm fighting back, Joestar. When he put it like that, I had to go. You're a man, ain't you? Mirio Taisu chimed in. I don't care if you're English or Japanese. You need to grow some balls. Kira Yoshikage is a scumbag who goes around murdering women. We can't let him live a lover's second. Stop mewling and let's get. Fukushiki and Hiroz were both staring at me, and even NYPD Blue was grinning and sticking his middle finger up. Damn it! Okay. Then Sugimoto, call me if... Oh, you can't. Uh, is there any way you can signal us? Yes. I can't stop the arrow across house when it's pointing any way but north, but I can make it spin. Then spin it if anything happens. Good. Let's go! Murio Taisu shouted, and summoned the Grand Blue Trio. We followed his lead and jumped on their backs. Right, don't let go. Jacques, Enzo, Joanna, skydiving. Go, go, go. Those must be the dolphins' names. At Muriel Tice's cry, the three dolphins chirped and shot away like rockets. To my surprise, it was much gentler than physics would ordinarily allow. G and centrifugal forces were entirely ignorable. Despite our speed, I could barely even feel the wind on my face. Why I would normally have been unable to open my eyes and have felt the flesh of my face bending out of shape, I felt nothing. The dolphin swept down the hill and across the fields, just off the surface of the ground. I wasn't sure if this was just a trait of the species, but the dolphins bounded across the farmland, leaping and diving, laughing all the way. Settle down, Jacques! Don't let him wind you up, Enzo, Joanna! This isn't a game! Muriel Taisu yelled. What had taken twenty minutes by cab took two by dolphin. We were already passing Morio Station. I thought someone was bound to see us, but Morio Taisu led us down deserted alleys, past shuttered storefronts, and through tunnels without any traffic to speak of. This was his territory. Of course, with that van going around, it was likely a good portion of the population was heading for the school, I thought. But Hiroz, who was riding the same dolphin as me, his arms around my waist, said, Something's wrong. When we crossed the tracks, I caught a glimpse of the main road. But there is nobody crossing. There is nobody in the roundabout by the station either. Are the roads so deserted we don't need to hide? Rohan and the Nijimuras were also looking around, suspicious and worried. I guess they're all just super responsive and organised, Fukushiki said brightly. Reality check, shit for brains, NYPD Blue said. Look! He pointed at the temple. It was on fire. By the time we reached Jozenji, the temple had burned to the ground, and the fire was dying down. The main temple hall, the structure housing the bell, and the living quarters had all burned. We got off the dolphins and moved closer. Without even looking inside, we were already struck dumb. It was clear the fire had started inside. The walls and pillars that survived were burned on the inside only. But what really got to us was the pile of gas tanks outside the closed doors. The air smelled of oil and gasoline. But why? It seemed they had set themselves on fire. 
What little the fire had left of the walls and floor were covered in drawings of moths or butterflies. The drawings were done with charcoal. Wait, looking closer, I could see blood and bits of flesh. Behind me, Heroes and the Nijimuras turned and ran, retching. Outside, they heard the splat of their vomit on the ground. They drew these pictures while they were on fire, Rohan asked. But what were they drawing? It wasn't an ordinary moth or butterfly. It had two burly legs and a large head with eyes staring out at us. It was hideous and yet beautiful, Rohan said. I turned to look at him. What? That's what I thought, he protested. But that's not what my look meant. I'd felt the same thing. This beauty, Rohan said. Do you feel it? They all drew so many mothmen. These drawings appear to be some sort of chimera of humans and moths. So mothmen seem that. But why did they draw so many of them? There were more drawings of the Mothman than there are people dead. Why? The word Mothman was oddly terrifying and I was having trouble getting past it. Rohan kept talking. They were trying to get it right, but none of the drawings did him justice, so they had to try again, using ash and charred flesh from their own burning bodies. I stared at him in horror. I'm an artist, I can tell. I know what it feels like to fill every available white space, desperately trying to capture the image in your head. It was beauty thereafter. Beauty, they sought. You remember what I told you earlier? Symmetry is the basis of man-made beauty. Oh, certainly the Mothman was... symmetrical? My voice was hoarse. The stench of burned flesh was making me light-headed. Indeed! Rohan said cheerily. With their muscles burning, they couldn't stop their hands shaking, but each of them sought the same for beauty. In a sense, this is a miracle, a terrifying one, but no less impressive. In spirit or in flesh, Rohan was clearly a little mad, but I had to admit, I understood how he felt. But I was less concerned with how incredible these events were than how they'd come to pass at all. Who knows? When Morio suddenly started moving, Perhaps they all assumed Buddha was punishing us and gathered here in a panic? Perhaps there's some strange Buddhist sect I'm completely unaware of. No. No kind of Buddhism teaches group suicide or self-immolation, I said, struggling to stay on my feet. If I let my guard down for a second, I'd fall on one of the corpses. What happened here must have been some sort of mass hysteria. Anxious people, gathered in a room, the door locked. Rohan and I looked at each other. The same idea in both our minds. There was another locked room nearby, with even more anxious people gathered in it. We turned as one, and ran out of the temple. I don't know how you could stand it in there, Muriel Taisu said, wiping vomit off his chin. Summon Grand Blue! We have to get to the gym! Rohan cried. The urgency in his tone was such that Muriel Taisu didn't question it. In a flash, the three dolphins hovered in front of us, and we sped off so fast we nearly left Hiroshi and Fukushigi behind. If you want everyone in town to survive, hurry. Don't worry about being seen. Get us to the gym as fast as possible. Murio Taisu roared, and the dolphins sped up, no longer bounding across the ground, rocketing towards the school. We reached the school grounds in a few dozen seconds, crossed the sea of cars parked outside, and reached the gym to find a few thousand people pouring gasoline on each other. They, they were all muttering under their breath. No one was giving directions. They glanced in our direction, but saw nothing, even though we must have appeared to be hovering in midair. Listen close, listening closer, I could make out what they were saying. Scared, 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 scared. I shivered. Instinctively, I knew I couldn't afford to listen to them for long. We began shouting, trying to drown out the muttering. Nobody heard. It was as if they were possessed. Nothing we did stopped them from preparing for suicide. Rohan was yelling Heaven's Door over and over, turning them into books but getting nowhere. Damn it! All their books are filled with the word scared! There's no white space left for me, for me to write any orders. What now, detective? What could I do? Alter the conditions. Scared people gathered in a locked room, preparing to set themselves on fire. It was hard to make them stop being scared, but we could break the locked room. Can we destroy the gym? The dolphins and I can break windows, Murio Taisu said, as if it was a bad idea. He went ahead and started doing just that. The sound of shattering glass filled the air, but broken windows weren't enough, 
and the townspeople kept pouring gasoline on each other. Fukushigi and NYPD Blue were helping break windows, but it was taking too much time. They were about to start the fire. Leave it to me, Hiro said. I turned to find him on the ground, with blue thunder spinning up. A moment later he was at the ceiling. Watch out for falling rubble! It's better than burning to death, right? He yelled, and the size of his stand's propellers abruptly increased until they filled the entire gym. Then they started spinning faster. His stand was no longer helicopter blades. It had become a giant shredder. It tore apart the walls, and the ceiling fell, but as it passed through the blades it was torn to tiny pieces. Hirose had both hands held out, with more propellers on them, blowing the fragments to each side of him, sending them hurtling out the windows the Nijimuras had broken. It was over in no time. I looked around, and some of the people were looking at us. Not all of them yet, though. With the walls this high, it was still almost a locked room. Hirose! I called. Get the walls! As low as you can! Okay, Hiro said, and shot me a thumbs up, then tilted his giant propeller slowly forward, quickly demolishing the front wall of the gym. The evening light streamed in, picking out the heavy dust in the air. Almost everyone turned to look. The locked room was gone. What? Gasoline? Oh, it stinks. This is bad. People had come to their senses at last. Everyone but Hiro's round their way through the crowds, calling out, For your own safety... Please step outside and wash off the gasoline. Their heads clear, people nodded, and began heading for the drink fountains, or the pool, or the shower rooms. Nobody panicked. There was no struggling or running. They weren't scared anymore. Just as I was about to relax, Rohan asked, Did you see anyone who might be Kira Yoshikage? I had completely forgotten about that. Unfortunately. Come on, detective! That's our main reason for being here. Stop gawking and think. Man, he could be kind of a dick sometimes, I thought. He kept talking. Not just think. Look. Take a good look at everything. Almost everyone in town is here. Think while you look. The question is, what are you looking for? What do you need to see? You know nothing about what you might look like. If you ask me, changing your face and fingerprints to become someone else isn't as easy as it sounds. Kira Yoshikage is 38. You can't just pick someone the same height. They'd have to be the same age and the same skin tone and build. Kira looked after himself, kept in shape, worked out a fair amount to keep thin. Could he easily take another's place without anyone's noticing? A wife or a lover would notice almost at once. And then there's the matter of his occupation. Kira worked quietly in the administrative department of an appliance company, an unobtrusive salaryman job. But he'd been there long enough to get promoted to chief clerk, so if his new identity was the same age, he would have a similar level of responsibility. Could you do a different job with different co-workers in a totally different position without anyone noticing? I imagine it would be quite a challenge. And then there's your home. If he had a wife and kids, he'd never be able to risk going home the evening he changed identities. His face may look right, but his voice is different, and he'd have no idea what his wife and kids' names were. And even more practically... He wouldn't remember what they talked about that morning. That would certainly arouse suspicion. But these problems are all ones a delicate, careful type of psychopath like Kira would have been well aware of, and taken care of to avoid. Yet he used Suji Aya's face-off to replace someone else, which means he must have believed this was someone he could easily replace. This logic seems sound. So, if you look at the whole thing backwards, you'll see how Kira got past all the problems I just mentioned. He had to have known his victim's body, work and family wouldn't pose a threat. Those are the three things that would be hardest to deal with. To get past the problem of family, you'd need someone single, unmarried, or at least separated, or working far from home. For work, you'd need someone in the same line of work, or unemployed, or you'd have to change jobs immediately after taking over. That leaves the physical end. And if he has no family or job to worry about, that hardly matters anymore. You see what I'm driving at? Probably. You mean, you can't tell what someone's job is, or what their social life is like just by looking at them? Yes. So, the man Kira replaced was someone he knew, someone he'd studied as a candidate to replace. But then how could he know he'd be able to find this person in time to avoid capture? It was pure coincidence he round up fighting Hiroz and the others at the tailors, right? Of course it was. He headed for Suji Aya's place. What line of work was she in? She could exchange people's body parts, remember? Her line of work was hardly legal. 
She wasn't a bad girl, but she walked a very thin line. But officially, she ran a beauty parlour. It was called Cinderella. So he'd have to grab someone he could replace on the way to the beauty parlour from the tailors, right? But Kira was a very careful man. He was. That lay at the root of his cursed luck. His intense focus forced fortune and coincidence onto his side. That's one way of looking at it. But if Kira knew what Tsujiaya's power was, he would definitely have laid plans in case he needed to make use of it. I agree. Hmm. Yet he can never know when he might be in that sort of trouble. There's only one way I can see to eliminate coincidence as a factor. What would that be? M simple. Make sure this candidate was also at, always at Suji Aya's side. I see. Beauty parlors rarely have male employees, though, what with all the changing of clothes. But she did. He only helped with a secret business, though. More of a gigolo, really. I've no taste for such gossip, so I never met the man. But Yamagishi said he was middle-aged, but not bad-looking. Yamagishi her, is Hirose's girlfriend. What happened to him? No idea, but he would have worked perfectly for Kira's needs. Gigolos have no real family and no real job. Stealing his body would have been no problem at all. We'd better start by investigating that man. Standing here watching people won't get us anywhere. I have no idea what that man looked like. Kuchikun! He yelled shrilly, stalking away. A tall man in a suit, despite the heat, came over to me. Thank you, thank you. I'm Shishimaru Denta, the mayor of Morio. That was a very close call, and you have my gratitude. He intoned hoarsely. His suit reeked of gasoline. Oh, it was nothing. I'm glad everyone's safe. I really have no idea what we were thinking. I didn't dump this on myself, you know. My own secretary poured it on me. Terrifying! My right hand tried to burn me to death. You poured gasoline on me, sir. I could say the same, said a thin man standing behind Shishimaru. He was soaked through as well. Either way, it's dangerous, so wash that, wash that off, I said. No telling what might set this place off. Of course, we've called the fire department. By the way, how is it you can fly? Eh? I can't fly, I said. Then again, I suppose they would have looked as if I was. Either way, I was better off not admitting it. You were hardly yourself. You must have imagined it. No, no, I'm sure of it. You came flying in and saved us all. Talking to this man was like having hot air blown in your face, and I nearly forgotten I had a message for him from Funny Valentine. But I wasn't the one who'd been given the message. No, this was no time for cribbles. And there was one more thing I was forgetting. Meh. On our way here, we found a lot of people dead in Jozenji. I believe what almost happened here happened there. Good lord. Is that... Shishimaru stammered. His secretary tapped him on the shoulder. Kumoi's here. Shishimaru followed his secretary's gaze and scowled. I turned to look and saw another tall man in a sulking wet suit, one with very thin arms and legs. He was surrounded by other men in suits, and they were hurriedly leaving. Eh? What? Was he listening? The chief of staff's boy was. Really? Kumoi. Oh, his opponent in the election. The election card had been blaring the name. Kumotaku. Now that they'd returned to their senses, the lot of them were immediately turning their attention back to the election. I had no idea how effective rushing to the place where people had died and making a scene would be. No, I suppose I did. In a town this small, the leader would be blamed for any tragedy at all. Those that had survived here were hardly out of danger yet, and there could well be others in danger somewhere else. At this point, a thought struck me. The others... When we left Arrow Cross, the van telling people to gather at the Budogoka gym was heading slowly towards the harbour. People from the harbour wouldn't have been able to reach the gym faster than us. Possessed by that unnatural fear, the gym was hardly the only place they could be affected. Like the people in the temple, it would take hold anywhere a large number of people would gather. Was there something like that in the harbour? From what I'd seen, it was all little shops and inns. But on the hill, right next to us, was the ideal building. Arrow Cross House. I ran out of the shattered gym and looked towards Arrow Cross, but there were houses in the way and it was too far to see. Heroes! Nijimura! I called. Fukushigi showed up first. What? he said, running over, but he couldn't help me. Murio Taisu! What the hell? Fukushigi said. Murio Taisu came running up behind him. What? Check on Arrow Cross. Right. 
He bounded aboard a dolphin and shot up into the air. Shishimaru came running after us. Ha! I knew it! You kids can fly! I ignored him. Murio Taisu glanced down at us, then flew off towards our cross without another word. The other two dolphins came down to us. Fukushigi, come on! Right! He must have seen something wrong. Fukushigi agreed, and the two of us jumped onto the dolphins. The dolphins flew away. Hey! What's going on? Shishimaru yelled. I could see it now. The Arrow Cross house was rocking from side to side. The signal we'd agreed on. We'd noticed too late. The dolphins were travelling even faster than before. There was no air pressure or vibrations. Just the overwhelming sense of speed. The scenery blowing past so fast that I imagined I could feel the inertia in the wind on my face. And nearly fell off. I gripped my teeth and tried to keep my fingers from slipping off the dolphin's fin. And at last we reached the Arrow Cross house. I could smell gasoline and see the empty tanks everywhere. I didn't see fire. Sugimoto! I called out. Fugashigi and I jumped down and burst into the house to find it empty. I went through the west sunroom into the study, but found no burned bodies, no sign anyone had been here. It was the same as we'd left it. Huh? We looked at each other, confused. Over here! A voice called. Murio Taisu had Sugimoto cradled in his arms. You okay? What happened? We called, running over. She's unharmed, Murio Taisu said, just in shock. People from the harbour came up, hell-bent on burning the house down. As a stand capable of moving this house, or its predecessor, the cube house, that must have felt like they were trying to kill her. But what happened to them? They're all under the house. Raimi stuck them all down there. Oh, so our cross moving wasn't an SOS, but a result of the battle. Relieved, I flopped down on the floor. I thought my hunch had come true, I said, so unsure why I'd had the hunch to begin with. Was it detective sense speaking? But it really did seem to be just some vague, baseless anxiety. If only I had some context to tie it to. Anything like that. The order of events. I'm going to put Raimi in her bed. Can you stand? She couldn't even answer. So he shifted her away so he could carry her in his arms and headed out the west door of the study. Even so, what's happening to my Morio? Fukushigi said, and stomped out the east door. Suddenly exhausted, I laid back on the rug the de desk rested on, and felt a strange lump under my back. What could it be? A small depression, but it felt hard. I peeled the rug back, and found a door. A door in the floor. I moved Rohan's desk aside, rolled up the rest of the rug and exposed the entire door. It was a rectangular door hidden in the middle of the interior hall. How would anyone know it was here? The front of the door was covered in the same carpet as the rest of the room, and the doorknob was recessed. To turn it, you had to hook a finger in and pull it out. The thing under my back had been the small groove your finger went in. It was sheer chance I'd found it at all. If I opened this, would I see beneath the arrow cross where all the people Sugi Sugimoto had hidden there lay piled on top of each other? Didn't seem likely. For one thing, this door opened outwards. There was no gap between the bottom of our cross and the ground. The whole point was to keep air from getting to Rohan and Fukushigi. There should be no way that a door could ever open downwards. And yet here was a door that did. Where could it lead? I made up my mind, turned the knob, and let the door fall inside. It opened. The door fell into an empty space that should not exist. Inside was a space exactly the same as the study. Rohan's desk and the carpet were nowhere to be found, but it was otherwise an exact copy of the room I was in. I was looking down on it from the middle of the ceiling. On the floor below me I saw another door. Did that open to another room below? I stuck my head through the door and looked around the room below. There were doors on all four sides, the same as the ones in this room that led to the sunrooms. But there was no way this room could exist in the Arrow Cross. So this wasn't the Arrow Cross house, but a room in the Cube house. Only the surface layer had changed into the Arrow Cross house. The Cube house still remained within. The laws of physics didn't apply to stands. So of course I wanted to climb down into that room, which meant I had to think. I didn't have a rope. I wondered if I could ray the rug down with the desk, lower myself a meter or two with that, and then jump the rest of the way. But it looked a bit too far, and I didn't think the desk was heavy enough. Then I had an idea. Jacques! Enzo! Johanna! I called. I waited a moment, and sure enough, one of the dolphins came swinging through the air towards me, clucking. The one I'd ridden both times before. Jacques? 
Enzo. Joanna. Bounce, bounce. She did a circle around me and then did a flip. Joanna, can you give me a ride down there? She slid through my legs and immediately plunged through the door. I quickly jumped on. I let her carry me around the room below for a few minutes. Up and down, round and around like a merry-go-round. Then I tapped her side and said, OK, put me down. She squeaked and landed as lightly and quietly as a paper airplane. She began circling the room again, which was adorable. I wanted to keep her, but she wasn't my stand, and asking Muriel Taisu for her would just make him mad. The carpet on the floor was the same as the one upstairs. I bent down, pulled on the knob and opened it. There was another room below it. It too was identical to the study. There was yet another door in the floor. Joanna, I called, and had her take me down again. I opened this door too, and found another copy of the study. I had Joanna take me down again, into the third room down from the original study, and opened the door in that floor, and found another room below that. But this wasn't a new room. I'd seen it before. It was the same as all of them, but this one had Rohan's desk. It had the rolled up rug, and the door in the floor was open. I was looking down from the ceiling, but I could see another door through the door in the floor, and that door was open too, and beyond that I saw a dolphin fly past, and in the room with a dolphin I saw someone. Me. I was crouched over an open door, looking down. Through three de doors like the one I was looking through, I could see the back of my own head four rooms below. I looked up. Beyond the door in the ceiling I'd just come through, and beyond the yon one before, beyond that, I could see someone in a door I'd never noticed before, a door in the ceiling to Rohan's study. Still looking up, I waved, and so did the person floor falls above me. It was me again. I was above me and below me. It was like standing between two mirrors. Leaving the door open, I stood up, moved over to the door to the east and opened it. I'd assumed it would lead to a sunroom, or the hall leading to the sunrooms. But to my surprise, it was neither. Just another study. Ah... I went to the middle of the room, and of course there was another door on the floor. I bent down and opened it. It led to Rohan's study, but to my surprise, it didn't open a door in the wall, but a door in the ceiling. This was a habitable tesseract. The house that stood here before this one was a simple square building, but this was also bizarre, in that it had no windows or doors. That's what Rohan had said, but of course it didn't have any doors on the outside. What I'd been able to see wasn't the outside of the building so much as the boundary between it and the world. The study was a cube, and on each of its six sides, in other words, the four walls to the north, south, east and west, as well as the floor and ceiling, there was another identical cube. Each of those cubes were linked to each other, for a total of eight cubes leading into one another. The furthest cube outturned in on itself and was surrounded by the other seven. This was a tesseract, but the way the space twisted and turned was a logical abstraction, only possible in three dimensions with the power of a stand. And because this was also a house, even though it was a tesseract, it followed a bizarre set of rules that defied logic and physics. Namely, 1. Parallel movements remain on the floor. 2. Doors on the floor always connect to the ceiling. 3. The side doors to Rohan's study don't connect to the next rooms of the cube house, but to the halls of the arrow house. I climbed three down from Rohan's study and moved one sideways and opened the door. This floor door should have led to the side walls of Rohan's study, but it seemed the study had turned to meet me, and I'd opened the door in the ceiling instead. This was inconsistent with physics and unnerving, so I decided to return the way I came, shutting the doors as I went. I closed the door beneath me and went back through the side door. I'd lost track of if this was the north, south, east or west door, but I shut the door behind me, closed the door in the floor, rolled Joanna up to the room above, shut that door, rolled Joanna up again, and closed the door on the floor of that room. One more room above and I'd be in the study again. I was about to call Joanna again when a door I'd never opened slammed shut. Who's there? I called out. No answer. But someone was there. Someone hiding in the next room over from the room below Rohan's study. In the room to the south. A room you couldn't get to directly from the study. Creepy. Joanna! I called the dolphin and went back up to the study. I hopped off and quickly closed the door. There was no lock. Oh well. I put the rug back and moved the desk a little from its original position, resting it on top of the door, so that if someone opened the door from the inside, the legs of the desk would hit them. If that didn't hurt them, there was a lot of stuff on the desks that would fall off and make a noise, and even if we didn't notice, they'd never be able to put it all back in the right place, so at least I'd know the door had been opened. 
The cube house didn't share any links to the arrow house other than the study, so the only thing left was the door in the ceiling. I looked up, thinking, but then... Hey, Jogstar! Fukushigi yelled, bursting in. I jumped a foot in the air. Ah, what? What? Come on, you gotta see this! Wasn't enough happening already? I thought, annoyed. But since I was scared of whoever was hiding in the cube house, I followed Fukushigi outside. Look at that! In the distance, I could see another island, thundering. I couldn't actually hear it, but it was clearly moving very quickly, across the ocean towards Morio. Morio wasn't the only island ship. Nero Nero Island was covered in rocks, and was about the tenth the size of Morio. It had come from just south of Sardinia, the second largest island in Italy. It was the headquarters of a mafia group, called the Pachon family. End of chapter 6